Yo, YouTube, hey, we got another Swamp Stories going on. This right here is the Nathaniels versus Serenios. This right here is the Wild Battle of San Francisco Turf. Let's gonna get into it. Other episode of Swamp Stories. For this video, we return to the city where everything began. We cover some important history and a wild story that not many are aware of. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. You can also follow the Instagram page as well. So let's get into it. San Francisco, California. In the recent years, this city has made the news for all of the wrong reasons. In fact, the media now paints it as some sort of dystopia where people can't even walk outside. But let me remind everyone that prior to 2020, San Francisco was seen in a completely different light. The city was known for its beautiful views, great tourist attractions, and overall great standard of life. On top of- When I think of San Francisco, I think of a uh, full house. Like the intro full house, this the intro full house, this right here. And all I did was went back. This the intro full house. I think of like full house, um, hill streets, like streets that got hills on it, stuff like that. But and you know the artists too, like I fuck with the artists from the day. Beautiful views, great tourist attractions, and overall great standard of life. On top of this, the massive tech boom of 2010 made the city even more desirable. Because of this great reputation, the world viewed... Look at the hill streets. I'm trying to hill streets, bro. You only get stuff like this in San Francisco, like, on that part, like... This is gorgeous, though, like, just seeing this, this is gorgeous. San Francisco was immune to the characteristics of Chicago or South Central LA. In fact, the words gangster and San Francisco are pretty much oxymorons in most people's minds. Like what? You order your vegan kale sandwich and then go slide on the ops? Give me a break. But all jokes aside, when you dive deeper than the surface, you discover a whole different side of San Francisco. Okay, now let me try to say this with a straight face. <clears throat> San Francisco is not... San Francisco is nothing to play with, and if you don't believe me, by the end of this video, you will be shocked. So let's dive in. Welcome to the Mission District of San Francisco. Since the beginning, the Mission has been the primarily Mexican neighborhood of the city. For those who are unfamiliar, it's pretty much the East LA of San Francisco. Many of the families migrated with nothing and came to make a living and provide a better life. But with poverty and lack of opportunity, many of the teenagers turned to a different life. So the mission always had a street aspect, but in the 1960s and 70s, they were all united as one. Clicks of friends would represent their blocker project, but that was pretty much it. For example, if you were from Shotwell Street, you would represent Shotwell only. Well, this dynamic would not last for long as the 1970s brought major change to California. As many of you know, the California prison system split into the north side and south side. Mexican inmates from above Bakersfield were supposed to rep the north and inmates from below were supposed to rep the south. Oh, okay. That's crazy. I know this. So they said above Bakersfield. I know Bakersfield is like far as shit, like, but that's crazy. Sal. At first, these affiliations were only meant for the penitentiary, but then they began spilling into the streets. As you know, how that is, is because people come home. When people come home, they think they could implement those rules into modern day society and it don't be working out like that mission natives began coming home from prison they well, brought their red rag home, affiliations with them through the 1970s most of the mission became norte territory as young members were encouraged to join during this period the mission kind of looked like this everywhere was norte except for a couple of projects army street and valencia gardens because nearly everyone represented the same thing the mission was pretty much safe Sometimes Northsider cliques in the mission would go against each other, but it never really boiled over. The only real rivals they had were located five hours away in Southern California. And at this time, no one could conceive the idea of Southsiders moving up north. 
But then came the 1980s when the unthinkable began taking place. Slowly but surely, Southsider members began migrating into the mission. At first, it was simply families from South Central and East LA trying to escape the streets. But little did these families know their teenage sons were already full-fledged Southsider members. And when they arrived, they were placed at the local Mission High School, easily the biggest Norte stronghold at the time. Obviously, this was a huge recipe for disaster. When you join the Southsiders, it's part of the code that you never drop your flag no matter where you're at. That means that if it's just you versus a thousand rivals, you still need to stand tall and never back down. So when these teenagers emerged at Mission High School, they wore their blue loud and proud. As you would expect, the Norte members at school were not thrilled. That's crazy. They probably packed their ass up, like... They, they probably will like, pack them niggas up like on some like and then you know they outnumber two and this was bad news because of this that's, that's when you got that's when you have students like man I ain't going to school I don't care what y'all talking about I ain't going this mission high school became the initial grounds for the beef and in 1990 the first documented incident took place in early October of 1990, a Southsider nicknamed Bouncer got into it with a Norte nicknamed Max. The two had multiple fights over the first week of October until Bouncer decided to take it to the next level. October 10th, 1990. It's a typical Wednesday afternoon and Mission High School lets out. Max leaves the school on foot and begins walking to his block on 22nd and Bryant. Little does he know, Bouncer has been following him since he exited the campus. Well, once Max gets far from the school, Bouncer begins to speed up and chase. He catches up to him on Folsom Street, he yells, and bang! Thankfully, Max would be okay after being rushed to the hospital. This was a bold move by the Southsiders as they were easily outnumbered 15 to 1 in the mission. Well, Max spent three weeks at SF General and was released on November 3rd, 1990. As soon as he's released, Max decides to go confront Bouncer about what he had done. So at 5 p.m., Max heads directly to Bouncer's block on 16th and Mission. Max walks to the corner and spots Bouncer outside of the gas station. So he boldly walks up to him and puts his hands up to squabble. But Bouncer, unfortunately, has no time time for these games. <laughs> Thankfully, Max was okay again and police were- Man, what the- Not you, son. He keep going there trying to squabble. Bruh, he up in- You still trying to- Man, he's gonna clock out his life, man. Come on, we're man. able to respond quickly and arrest Bouncer. After back-to-back -back scary incidents, Max had a- Hey, that's crazy. So that's like backdooring off the streets, like. Uh, we're gonna trick you out of here now. Enough, and he wanted to get revenge. Two weeks later, November 15th, 1990. After recovering again and being released from SF General, Max hits the streets. This time, he drives a van to the corner of 16th and Folsom. Because Bouncer is locked up, he looks for any of his Southsider associates. In front of the gas station, he spots Bouncer's right-hand man, Bayron Spider Alvarado. So he walks right up to him and bang. This was a huge deal in the mission as the Northsiders got revenge in a major way. And after multiple witnesses pointed him out, Max was arrested by SFPD. Now both Max and Bouncer were in SF County Jail where they squabbled multiple times. Well, here is how their cases turned out. Bouncer was convicted of the November 3rd incident, but in typical San Francisco fashion, he was only given two years in prison. And for Max, three missed trials in a row allowed him to walk free as an innocent man. As soon as both of them were released, okay. they went right back to their old street ways. But more importantly, they kicked off an unfortunate trend for teenagers at Mission High School. And that takes us to June 2nd, 1993. See, this is why I could live in the West Coast, because, bro, the gang politics is just wild. It's, it's just wild, bro. 
It's a week away from graduation at Mission High School and a senior named Michael Booth, also known as Frosty, is almost out. Frosty is an alleged member of the 24th Street Northsiders, but has plans to leave the city after graduation. Well, it's a typical Wednesday at 3.25 p.m. and Frosty walks down the steps of campus. He then walks across the street to the famous Mission Dolores Park, where students are known to hang out. As he's walking up the park, he runs into a former classmate and Southside arrival named Jose Quesada, also known as Quesadilla. They both freeze in their tracks, but then Quesadilla makes a devastating move. After dozens of witnesses came forward, police arrested Quesada and brought him to jail. But again, in typical San Francisco fashion, Quesada was only sentenced to three years in San Quentin. You may be thinking that he got off easy, but for Quesada, this would be for the worst. Quesada was released in early November of 1996 and returned to the streets of San Francisco like nothing had happened. In his mind, three years was enough for the community to forget what he had done. But in the mission, what you do is forever lasting and the community will never forget. That takes us to November 10th, 1996. It's a late Sunday night in the city, and Quesada happens to be at the El Toro nightclub celebrating his release. The club is located away from the mission, so he figures that he won't run into any rivals. Little does he know, in San Francisco, nothing is really that far away. Well, after hours of partying, the club lets out at 2 a.m., and Quesada walks outside to go to his car. As he exits the club, he notices two Norte members standing right in front of him. And before he can react, by this time, the Mission District had become San Francisco's most dangerous neighborhood, and as an unfortunate byproduct, it was creating some cold gangsters. But also, by the year 2000, the Mission District had a wave of new rappers. The neighborhood was primarily represented by a man named Tito Cedeno, commonly known as Gangsta Flea. Flea was a self-proclaimed wild Norteño, but he was also a very talented rapper. By 2002, his talents got him recognized by the legend Mac Dre. Dre found him to be one of the coldest rappers coming up in the Bay. So as a result, Flea and Mac Dre collaborated on multiple tracks. You had Mac Dre representing the crest and Gangsta Flea representing the mission on every song. As you would expect, this took his career to the next level and most definitely put the Mission District on the map. Still to this day, his song Latin Ghetto was a San Francisco classic. Well, the Mission District hero was also living the wild life of a Northsider. And everything came crashing down in the strangest way possible. Hey, it's her. January 12th, 2003. It's a late Saturday night in the peninsula, a suburban region located south of San Francisco. On this late night, Gangsta Flea is driving home from the studio with two fellow Mission Norte members. Members Richard Cedillo in the passenger seat and John Navarro in the back seat. As they're heading up Highway 280 in a Chevy Tahoe, Gangsta Flea starts driving erratically. He begins swerving and making abrupt stops on the freeway. Well, an Infinity G35 behind him begins honking to tell him to stop. For whatever reason, this pisses Gangsta Flea off as he changes lanes and allows the Infinity to speed up. Once the car gets beside his Tahoe, he rolls down the passenger window and reaches across. <laughs> Raymond Gardner was a Pacifica resident on his way home from San Jose. He had absolutely nothing to do with the streets or the Mission District. After the incident, his passenger in the car named Jeff Chin informed police that it was a white Chevy Tahoe. Well, because this happened in the normally peaceful San Mateo County, police did everything they could to investigate. Police were able to tie Gangsta Flea to the incident and they served a warrant at his Mission District residence. And that's when things get kind of crazy. After police kick down his door, Gangsta Flea runs downstairs to his garage. He then hops in his Chevy Tahoe, lets up the garage door, and drives out. He accelerates to over 100 miles an hour down Mission Street and gets on the freeway. He then gets on Highway 280 and drives to the Bay Bridge. As he's crossing the bridge, he no longer sees police behind him, so he kind of slows down. But once he reaches the city of Oakland, he notices dozens of highway patrol waiting for him right there. So he instantly gets off at the 
880 exit and heads down. He then takes police on a wild chase to the city of Hayward. Once he gets there, he figures that he officially lost them, so he gets on the San Mateo Bridge headed back to San Francisco. When he gets across the bridge, he notices that police are still behind him. At this point, he figures why not just drive back home, so Gangsta Flea drives right back home to the mission where police peacefully arrest him. After he was arrested, bro, you just went in a circle, bro. You just went in a circle just to go home. You wasted all that time, all them hours, bro. They could have just took you. Come on, man. Arrested, his two passengers were arrested as well. Well, right away at their initial hearing, Richard Cedillo testified that Gangsta Flea had done it. Because of this, he was instantly let out of jail. The district attorney offered the same deal to John Navarro, but he actually decided to stay solid. As a result, Gangsta Flea and John Navarro were both sentenced to life in prison. Gangsta Flea was truly a legend in the making, and it's sad that it had to go out like this. And that takes us to 2006, possibly the worst year in Mission District history. In 2006, the Mission District Southsiders were eager to expand their territory. By this time, they had taken over everything pretty much from 16th and Mission all the way up to the Tenderloin. And now it was their mission to take over everything from 17th all the way down to the Norte Territory on 24th. And unfortunately, to do this, they decided to send all kinds of physical messages. This generation was led by a man named Michael Robadeo, also known as Gallo. He and his right-hand man, Jonathan Aguilar, also known as Trompo, would send the message in 2006. March 14th, 2006. At 4 p.m., Gallo and Trompo roam around the mission looking for rivals. As they turn the corner of 15th and Mission, they spot two suspicious men at the bus stop, one wearing a 49ers jersey and the other wearing a 49ers hoodie. This is enough for Gallo to assume that they're Northsider members, so he and Trompo hop out of their car and walk up to the men. As it turns out, the two men had nothing to do with the mission politics. Instead, they just happened to be big fans of the 49ers. This kind of situation of mistaken identity was becoming far too common in the mission. The community activists vowed for this kind of thing to stop, but sadly, guys like Gaio did not care. Just 10 days later, it would happen again. March 24, 2006. Gaio and his fellow member Lonely spin around their territory looking for rivals. Again on 15th and Mission, they spot yet another man wearing red. So they double park their van and run across the street. They walk up to the man and without asking questions, bang. See, when, see, when people start doing wild stuff like that, bro, like it's not honorable, bro. You just terrorizing the community at, at that point. Like, you don't even know who you doing it. Like, you ain't saying you, who you, like, who you be. Like, you ain't saying nothing. Like, you just acted erratically. And come on, bro. That's, that's corny to me, bro. That's a real lot of corny. 2006 was an awful year all around San Francisco, and it got so bad that the district attorney developed gang injunctions Random all around the city. This was a controversial tactic that pretty much banned people from their own neighborhoods. So if SFPD believed that you were a member of a certain clique, you were no longer allowed to be in their territory. So for the mission, these were the two territories. If the Northsiders were found here, they would be taken to jail, and if the Southsiders were found here, they would be taken to jail as well. For both sides, part of being a member is hanging out on the turf, so they did not last for very long. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, SFPD would roam through the mission and take to jail any members they saw. Whether you believe in this tactic or not, it did bring peace to the mission for a few years. For sure. But then an unfortunate act would kick everything back off in 2011. On February 18th, 2011, a group of 16th Street Southsiders walk to the Norte Territory. They then walk up to a building on Bryant Street and they spray paint a giant blue X3. This was a big deal because the Southsiders were now essentially claiming this territory. The Northsiders were not happy and eight days later they would get their revenge. On February 26, 2011, a prominent Southsider member named Al- Bro, y'all- Y'all vandalizing buildings? 
Like, bro. How's that? Y'all vandalizing buildings at the top? Man, come on, bro. That's a storefront, bro. Who got nothing to do with nothing. This couldn't have been me, bro. Couldn't have been me. Aldo Traconzo was found on 17th and Mission. SFPD believed that this was revenge for him tagging up their territory, but sadly this did not satisfy their revenge. August 30th, 2011. A chef at a Mission District restaurant takes a short break to walk out and get some air. For sanitary purposes, he removes all of his gear and steps outside in a blue t-shirt. Coincidentally, when he steps outside, two Northsider members happen to be walking by. And sadly, this would not end well. Bro, so that's what I'm saying. Like, bro, people can't wear colors, bro. Like, you can't wear blue, nothing blue. You can't wear nothing red. Like, the politics. Like, how y'all dictating what a person could wear? Like, weird. Like, weird. Like, This was yet another sad case of mistaken identity in the mission. The community believed that this kind of thing ended in two And it's the same thing every time. We about to just march, protest, y'all stop this. Like, no, y'all gotta start taking physical action. Start putting Delta, cause ain't no way. Come on, bro. Two random guys, just sports fanatics cheering on a football team another random guy and another random guy this this last guy was a chef 2006 but sadly it was not done yet after doing this the two northsider members stayed up all night and into the next day and the next morning at 12 30 a.m they would catch a southsider member on the same exact block this would be a prominent member named Edson Lacayo, who was just walking his dog. Unfortunately, this ended in the same result. At this point, not even the injunction could save the mission. The next decade would bring drastic change to San Francisco, as many- Beijing, baby! Today- Oh my god, you're a drug dealer! You gonna plug or you gonna play? Start packing for the most outrageous trip of the year. Are they coming out? Yeah, but only seven, and I think I put in eight. Push, pull, twist it. It's not a puppet, it's my asshole. Joyride, now playing. It's never been easier to help preserve the simple joys of our world with clean choice energy. Switching to clean electricity is one of the simplest and... If you know, the tech boom brought a massive influx of new residents to the city. And for whatever reason, the mission became the trendy area that all of the hipsters wanted to move to. Because of this, it instantly became one of the most expensive neighborhoods in all of California. So year by year, more and more organic coffee shops, gluten-free this and vegan that began popping up in the area. This process unfortunately displaced thousands of Mission District families called gentrification that's what happened that's why y'all gotta start being smart start using the brain that god gave y'all because at the end of the day like everywhere in america we disvalue the land that we live on the areas that we live on we don't we don't let it we don't make it hold value right we're not owning our land. We're not keeping our houses up. We're not we getting tricked out of, out of our position with our houses. Like, hey, we'll offer you X amount of dollars for your house. You sell your house now five, 10 years, 20 years down the line. Everything around you is now million dollar, billion dollar cribs. You feel me? And you like, damn, your whole area just turned into something totally different. But you not thinking far ahead. You thinking about, oh, I, I can use this money right now. Or no. You not thinking what if or what could be of the area that you in. Man, people gotta start smarting up, man. People gotta start being smarter, bro. At least to cities like Fairfield, Vallejo, and even Sacramento. But on the other hand, coincidentally, the neighborhood became much, much safer. Starting around 2012, you began seeing non-locals walking down blocks no one would dare walk down in years prior. This was the new mission. But with
With all that being said, just because things changed did not mean it was no longer active, and that introduces us to a major family in the story. The family was headed by a man named Javier Campos, a local from 19th and Mission. Javier was a father to seven kids, the oldest being a stepkid named Jose Escobar, also known as Boo, and the youngest being Javier Campos III. Due to his family ties and where he grew up, his oldest son Boo joined the local 19th Street Southsiders. As you would expect, this kind of life got him caught up all the time and sent to San Francisco Juvenile Hall. This is where he spent year 15 all the way to 18 years old, missing all kinds of valuable steps. Because of this, he realized that this life would amount to nothing and he tried to turn his life around. Well, after his release in early 2012, Boo really put his best foot forward. He earned his GED, enrolled in classes at City College, and also got a job. On top of this, by the time of his release, his family had moved across the bridge to Richmond, California. At this time, Richmond was a I don't like that, you see what I'm saying? You see that the results that you put in, hey, it's not leading me nowhere. Let me try something else out. Let me use this up top. To try something else out. Yo, the possibilities is so endless with if you use your brain, bro. If you just sit, sit if you sit back and say, you know what, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna keep doing the same thing I've been doing. I'm gonna use my brain to put me in a whole different situation. Dangerous city, but the important part is that Boo was now away from his rivals. So for months, he worked hard to get his life in the right direction. His family says that his main motivation was to be an example for his younger brother. On top of this, his stepfather was set to come home from prison in August of 2012. And that takes us to August 20th, 2012. After being released from prison, Javier came home to his wife's family in Richmond. And after being home for 10 days, his wife decided to throw him a gathering at the house. So with his wife's family, Javier played video games, blasted music, and had a great time. But then a silly argument broke out between Javier and his brother-in-law named Luis Carrillo. Instead of turning the situation worse, Javier decided to leave the house and go on a drive. So for an hour, he drives to a view, sits in his car, and thinks. 10 p.m. After sitting and thinking for an hour, he calls up Luis and tells him to meet him in a Taco Bell parking lot. At 10.30, the two meet up in the middle of the parking lot. They discuss their issues and Javier tries to calm him down. He then yells, your problem is with your sister, not me. And for whatever reason, Luis's sister named Erica takes offense and tells him to go f*** him. So Luis listens and walks up to Javier. After the incident, both Luis and Erica Carrillo were arrested, but more importantly, Javier's family was now torn. His stepson Boo took this very harshly, but he decided to step up as a father figure for his brother. And as you would expect, after this incident, he no longer wanted to be around his mother's family. So that's when he decided to go back to living in the mission. Unfortunately, this would not go well. October 20th, 2012. It's a Saturday night in the city, and Boo is at a friend's apartment on... <laughs> the number one most dependable mass market brand, three years in a row by JD Power. 16th in Mission. At 2.45, Boo walks downstairs waiting for another friend to pick him up. He waits on the corner for 15 minutes, but that's when the unexpected appears. Three Northsiders walk up to him and As you would expect, this whole ordeal was very hard on Javier III. Without his father and now his older brother, life would not be easy. At this time, he was just in middle school, but within the next few years, his life would fall down the same exact path. By his teenage years, Javier would jump off the porch with the 19th Street Southsiders, and now he would go by the nickname J-Baby. Most of his teenage years were either spent on the block or in the cell blocks of SF Juvenile Hall. While by the time J-Baby became an adult, more tragedy would come. J-Baby had an older friend from the neighborhood named Spunks, but his real name was Demandre Perkins. Despite a wild past in the streets, Demandre was in the process of changing his life. By 2020, the now 26-year-old had picked up a job as a youth counselor in the troubled Tenderloin. Mm -hmm. So instead of hanging on the block like he used to, his new schedule was helping out the youth. 
But then came March of 2020, when the entire world changed within two weeks. By the second week of March, his job had closed and he had to return to the neighborhood. That takes us to March 16th, 2020. Demandre decides to meet up with his friends at the Pizza and Curry restaurant on 16th and Mission. First of all, pizza and curry sounds like an outrageous combo. Regardless, Demandre and his friends are enjoying their pizza and curry when boom, a group of three Northsiders bust in the door. They then walk up to the table and bang. Yo, people are bold, bro. People are bold, bro. People don't even think like, yo, it's cameras here, bro. I'm sad, like, people be thinking with the wrong brain, man. People just be so caught up in the moment, willing to risk it all. Three documented Northsider members were arrested after the incident. As you would expect, J-Baby was distraught by all of this loss, but he decided to translate it into a rap career. Under the name Boo Gang J-Baby, he actually dropped some pretty decent tracks. His songs were filled with Northsider disses, but not all of it was just rap. J-Baby truly despised his rivals, and he was willing to travel around to prove it. January 23rd, 2023. Three it's a typical later. afternoon in East Oakland and a popular Stockton rapper is recording a music video. This would be Acito, one of the most popular Norte rappers in Cali. Well, on this afternoon, he happens to be 40 to 50 deep at a gas station on MacArthur Boulevard. Well, because he's an hour away from Stockton, he expects things to go smoothly. Well, little does he know, J-Baby heard about the video shoot and he's on his way. 6 p.m. During the video shoot, a gray Mercedes C300 rolls up. And that's when J-Baby allegedly rolls down his window. <laughs> After the incident, Oakland police used security cameras to get the license plate of the Mercedes C300. And what they discovered is that the car is registered to San Francisco resident Javier Campos III. So a few days after the incident... What I've been saying out this whole video... Brain, you go with your own vehicle. You go with your own B. Then J Baby now had a warrant for his arrest. Strangely, though, J Baby wouldn't even be raided or really anything. He continued his regular life and even dropped multiple music videos. This lasted for months and Oakland police never tried to arrest him. J Baby was still driving around the bay in the same Mercedes C300. I don't know what's going on in Oakland, but that takes us to June 9th, 2023. It's a Friday night in the mission and there happens to be a large gathering on 24th and Mission. At at the gathering are a few Northsider members, but mostly skaters and local artists. Well, once J-Baby gets word of this gathering, he's not too thrilled to say the least. So he instantly hops in his Mercedes alone and drives down to 24. When he arrives, he allegedly rolls down his window and bang. Thankfully, everyone made it, but this was yet another scary incident. SFPD would instantly review the footage and arrest J-Baby the next day, Friday. But tonight, we've learned from police sources officers are looking for this man. Sources say Javier Campos is a person of interest because this Mercedes that you see right next to his photo, he's linked to it. It was spotted leaving the scene around the time of the sh Bay Area's Chrissy Smith is in San Francisco. He's currently facing life in prison for both the Oakland and San Francisco incident. Man, 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 this is a crazy situation, and I hope everyone watching realizes how destructive and pointless this life really is. It's not cool to yeah. lose friends and to face life behind bars. Trust I was, me. Hey, I was just about to say that. She just said that. I didn't mean to say that. I was just about to say that, bro. This kind of lifestyle is nothing that anyone should ever want to be a part of. And on that note, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Swamp Stories. And if you did, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. Also, please let me know in the comments what you want to see next. Peace! Yeah. See y'all in the next video.